Uh, when we were children, we were taught one, two, three, and A, B, C. But we weren't sat down on our mother's knees and taught the game of black and white. That's the thing that was left out of all our educations. That life is not a conflict between opposites, but a polarity. The difference between a conflict and a polarity is simply when you say about opposite things, we sometimes use the expression, these two things are the poles apart. You say, for example, with someone with whom you totally disagree, I'm the poles apart from this person. But your very saying that gives the show away. Poles. Poles are the opposite ends of one magnet. And if you take a magnet, the North Pole and the South Pole. Right, chop off the South Pole, move it away. The piece you've got left creates a new South Pole. You never get rid of the South Pole. Things may be the poles apart, but they go together. You can't have the one without the other. That's the basic idea of polarity. But what we are trying to imagine is the encounter of forces that come from absolutely opposed realms that have nothing in common when we say of two personality types that they're the poles apart. We are trying to think eccentrically instead of concentrically. And so in this way, we haven't realized that life and death, black and white, good and evil, being and non-being, come from the same center. They imply each other so that you wouldn't know the one without the other. Now, I'm not saying that that's bad. That's fun. You are playing the game that you don't know that self and other go together in just the same way as the two poles of the magnet. So that when anybody in our culture says, uh, slips into the state of consciousness where they suddenly find this to be true and they come on and say, I'm God, we say you're insane. Now, it's very difficult. You, you can very easily slip into the state of consciousness where you feel you're God. It can happen to anyone. Just in the same way as you can get the flu or uh, measles or something like that, you can slip into the state of consciousness. When you get it, it depends upon your background and your training as to how you're going to interpret it. If you've got the idea of God that comes from popular Christianity, God as the governor, the political head of the world, and you think you're God, then you say to everybody, well, you should bow down and worship me. But if you're a member of Hindu culture and you suddenly tell all your friends I'm God, instead of saying you're insane, they say congratulations, at last you found out. Because their idea of God is not the autocratic governor. When they uh, make images of Shiva, say he has ten arms. How would you use ten arms? It's hard enough to use two. You know, if you play the organ, you've got to use your two feet and your two hands, and you play different rhythms with each member. It's kind of tricky. But actually, we're all masters of this, because how do you grow each hair without having to think about it? Each nerve. How do you beat your heart and digest with your stomach at the same time? You don't have to think about it. In your very body, you are omnipotent in the true sense of omnipotence, which is that you are able to be omnipotent. You are able to do all these things without having to think about it. When I was a child, I used to ask my mother, of course, all sorts of ridiculous questions that every child asks. And when she got bored with my question, she'd say, darling, there are some things we're just not meant to know. 
And I said, will we ever know? She said, yes, of course, when we die and go to heaven, every God will make everything plain. So I used to imagine that on wet afternoons in heaven, we'd all sit around the throne of grace and say to God, well, now, why did you do this? And how did you do that? And he would explain it to us. Heavenly Father, why are the leaves green? And he would say, because of the chlorophyll. And we'd say, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but in the Hindu universe, you would say to God, how did you make the mountains? And he would say, well, I just did it. Because what you're asking me for, when you ask me, how did I make the mountains? You're asking me to describe in words how I made and there are no words which can do this. Words cannot tell you how I made the mountains any more than I can drink the ocean with a fork. A fork may be useful for sticking into a piece of something and eating it, but it won't, it is, it's no use for, for, for imbibing the ocean. It would take millions of years. So it would take millions of years. In other words, you would be bored with my description long before I got through it, if I put it to you in words. Because I didn't create the mountains with words. I just did it. Like you open and close your hand. You know how to do this, but can you describe in words how you do it? But you do it. You are conscious, aren't you? Do you know how you manage to be conscious? Do you know how you beat your heart? Can you say in words, explain correctly how this is done? You do it, but you can't put it into words. Because words are too clumsy. And yet you manage this expert for as long as you're able to do it. This concludes session one of Out of Your Mind, Essential Listening from the Alan Watts Audio Archives. Our program continues with session two. Sounds True presents Out of Your Mind. Essential listening from the Alan Watts Audio Archives. Session two. Nature of Consciousness, Part 2, with Alan Watts. We are playing a game. And the game runs like this. The only thing you really know is what you can put into words. Let's suppose I love some girl, rapturously. And somebody says to me, would well, you really love her? Well, how am I going to prove this? Well, I say, uh, write poetry. Tell us all how much you love her, then we'll believe you. So if I'm an artist and I can put this into words and convince everybody that I've written the most ecstatic love letters ever written, they say, all right, okay, we, we'll admit it. You really do love her. But supposing you're not very articulate, are we going to tell you you don't love her? Surely not. You don't have to be Heloise and Abelard to be in love. So the whole game that our culture is playing is that nothing really happens unless it's in the newspaper. So we're, when we are at a party, and there's a great party, somebody said, it's too bad there wasn't a tape recorder. And so our children begin to feel that they don't exist authentically unless they get their names in the papers. And the fastest way of getting your name in the papers is to commit a crime. And then you'll be photographed, then you'll appear in court, and everybody will notice you. It really happened if it was recorded. In other words, if you shout and there doesn't, doesn't come back an echo, it didn't happen. Well, that's a real hang-up. It's true, the fun with echoes. We all like singing in the bathtub because there's more resonance there. And when we play a musical instrument like a violin or a cello, it has a sounding box because that gives resonance to the sound. 
And in the same way, the cortex of the human brain enables us, when we are happy, to know that we are happy. And that gives a certain resonance to it. If you're happy and you don't know you're happy, there's nobody home. But this is the whole problem for us. Several thousand years ago, human beings evolved the system of self-consciousness. And uh, they knew, they, they knew. There was a young man who said, though, it seems that I know that I know. What I would like to see is the I that knows me when I know that I know that I know. See? And, and this is uh, the human problem. We know that we know. And so there came a point in our evolution when we didn't guide life by just trusting our instincts and had to think about it and had to purposely arrange and discipline and push our lives around in accordance with foresight and words and systems of symbols, accountancy, calculation, and so on. And then we worry. Once you start thinking about things, you worry as to whether you've thought enough. Did you really take all the details into consideration? Was every fact properly reviewed? And by Jove, the more you think about it, the more you realize that uh, you really couldn't take everything into consideration because all the variables in any human decision are incalculable. So you get anxiety. And this, though, also, this is the price you pay for knowing that you know, for being able to think about thinking, to feel about feeling. And so you're in this funny position. Now then, do you see that this is simultaneously an advantage and a terrible disadvantage? What has happened here is that by having a certain kind of consciousness, a certain kind of reflexive consciousness, being aware of being aware, being able to represent what goes on fundamentally in terms of a system of symbols, such as words, such as numbers. You put, as it were, two lives together at once, one representing the other. The symbols representing the reality, the money representing the wealth, And if you don't realize that the symbol is really secondary, it doesn't have the same value. You know, people go to the supermarket and they uh, get a whole cartload of goodies and they drive it through. And then the clerk fixes up the counter and this long tape comes out. And you say, $30, please. Everybody feels depressed. Because they, they give away $30 worth of paper, but they've got a cartload of goodies. They don't think about that. They think they just lost, lost $30. But you've got the real wealth in the card. All you parted with was the paper. Because the paper in our system becomes more valuable than the wealth. It represents power, potentiality. Whereas the wealth, you think, oh well, that's just necessary. You've got to eat. Well, I mean, that's to be really mixed up. So then, if you awaken from this illusion and you understand that black implies white, self implies other, life implies death, or shall I say, death implies life. You can feel yourself, not as a stranger in the world, not as something here on probation, not as something that has arrived here by fluke, but you can begin to feel your own existence as absolutely fundamental. 
what you are basically. Deep, deep down, far, far in, is simply the fabric and structure of existence itself. So, say in Hindu mythology, they say that the world is the drama of God. God is not something in Hindu mythology with a white beard and that sits on a throne and that has royal prerogatives. God in, in Indian mythology is the self, Satchitananda, which means Sat, that which is, Chit, that which is consciousness, that which is Ananda is bliss. And in other words, re, the, the, what exists, reality itself, is gorgeous. It is the plenum, the fullness of total joy. Wow, we. And all those stars, if you look out in the sky, as a firework display, like you see on the 4th of July, which is a great occasion for celebration, the universe is a celebration. It is a firework show to celebrate that existence is. Wow, we. And then they say, but however, there's no point just in sustaining bliss. Let's suppose that you were able every night to dream any dream you wanted to dream. And that you could, for example, have the power within one night to dream 75 years of time. Or any length of time you wanted to have. And you would naturally, as you began on this adventure of dreams, you would fulfill all your wishes. You would have every kind of pleasure you could conceive. And after several nights of 75 years of total pleasure each, you would say, well, that was pretty great. But now let's, um, let's have a surprise. Let's have a dream which isn't under control. Well, something is going to happen to me that I don't know what it's going to be. And uh, you, you would dig that and come out of that and say, wow, that was a, a close shave, wasn't it? Then you would get more and more adventurous and you would make further and further out gambles as to what you would dream. And finally, you would dream where you are now. You would dream the dream of living the life that you are actually living today. That would be within the infinite multiplicity of choices you would have, of playing that you weren't God. Because the whole nature of the Godhead, according to this idea, is to play that he's not. The first thing he says to himself is, man, get lost. because he gives himself away. The nature of love is self-abandonment, not clinging to oneself, throwing yourself out, as in, for example, in basketball, you're always getting rid of the ball. You say to the other fellow, have a ball, see? And uh, that, that keeps things moving. That's the nature of life. So in this idea then, everybody is fundamentally the ultimate reality, not God in a politically kingly sense, but God in the sense of being the self, the deep down basic whatever there is, and you're all that, only you're pretending you're not. And it's perfectly okay to pretend you're not, to be absolutely convinced, because this is the whole notion of drama. When you come into the theatre, there is a proscenium arch and a stage and down there is the audience. And everybody assumes their seats in the theater and uh, are going to see a comedy, a tragedy, a thriller or whatever it is. And they all know as they come in and pay their admissions that what is going to happen on the stage is not for real. But the actors have a conspiracy against this because they are going to try and persuade the audience that what is happening on the stage is for real. They want to get everybody sitting on the edge of their chairs. They want to get you terrified or crying or laughing. Ab absolutely captivated by the drama. And if a skillful human actor
can take in an audience and make people cry. Think what the cosmic actor can do. Why, he can take himself in completely. He can play so much for real that he really believes it is. Like you sitting in this room, you think you're really here. Why, you've persuaded yourself that way. You've acted it so damn well that you know this is the real world. But you're playing it. Because the audience and the actor is one. Because behind the stage there's the green room. Off scene, obscene. Where the actors take off their masks. You know that the word person means mask? The persona, which is the mask worn by actors in Greco-Roman drama. Because it has a megaphone type mouth which throws the sound out in an open-air theater. So pair through sona, what the sound comes through, that's the mask. How to be a real person, how to be a genuine fake. A mask. So the dramatis personae at the beginning of a play is the list of masks that the actors will wear. And so in the course of forgetting that this, this life is a drama, the word for the role, the word for the mask, has come to mean who you are genuinely, the person, the proper person. Incidentally, the word parson is derived from the word person. <laughs> person of the village, person around town, parson. It's funny. So anyway then, this is the drama. I'm not trying to sell you on this idea in the sense of converting you to it. I want you to play with it. I want you to think of its possibilities. I'm not trying to prove it. I'm just putting it forward as a possibility of life to think about. So then, this means that you're not victims of a scheme of things, of a mechanical world, or of an autocratic god. The life you're living is what you only you don't admit it because you want to play the game that it's happened to you. In other words, I got mixed up in this world. My parents, I had a father who got hot pants over a girl and she was my mother. And uh, because he got, the, he, was just a, he was just a horny old man. And as a result of that, I got born. And I blame him for it and say, well, that's your fault. You've got to look after me. And he says, I don't see why I should look after you. You're just a result. <laughs> and, but let's suppose we admit that I really wanted to get born and that I was the ugly gleam in my father's eye when he approached my mother. That was me. I was desire. And I deliberately got involved in this thing. Look at it that way instead. And that even if I got myself into an awful mess, and I got born with syphilis and the great Siberian itch and tuberculosis and uh, in a Nazi concentration camp, nevertheless, this was a game which was a very far out play. It was a kind of cosmic masochism. But I did it. Isn't that an optimal game rule for life? Because if you play life on the supposition that you're a helpless little puppet that got involved, or if you play it on the supposition that it's a, a frightful, serious risk and that we really ought to do something about it and uh, so on, it's a drag. There's no point in going on living unless we make the assumption that the situation of life is optimal. That really and truly, we are all in a state of total bliss and delight. But we are going to pretend we aren't just for kicks. You play non-bliss in order to be able to experience bliss. And you can go as far out as non-bliss as you want to go. And when you wake up, it'll be great. You know, you can slam yourself on the head with a hammer because it's so nice when you stop. And it makes you realize, you see, how, how great things are when you 
forget that that's the way it is. And that's just like black and white. You don't know black unless you know white. You don't know white unless you know black. This is simply fundamental. So then, here's the drama. My metaphysics, let me be perfectly frank with you, are that there is the sinful self. You can call it God. You can call it anything you like. And it's all of us. It's playing all the parts of all beings whatsoever, everywhere and anywhere. And it's playing the game of hide and seek with itself. It gets lost, it gets involved in the farthest out adventures. But in the end, it always wakes up and comes back to itself. And when you're ready to wake up, you're going to wake up. And if you're not ready, you're going to stay pretending that you're just a little, poor little me. And uh, since you're all here and engaged in this sort of inquiry and listening to this sort of lecture, I assume that you're all on the process of waking up. Or else you're teasing yourselves with some kind of uh, flirtation with waking up, which you're not serious about. But I assume yeah, maybe you are not serious but sincere, that you are ready to wake up. So then, when you're in the way of waking up and finding out who you really are, you meet a character called a guru. As the Hindus say, this word, the teacher, the awakener. And what is the function of a guru? He's the man who looks at you in the eye. So that's oh, come on. <laughs> I know who you are. You know, you come to the guru and say, sir, I have a problem. I'm unhappy and I want to get one up on the universe or I want to become enlightened. I want spiritual wisdom. Ah, and the guru looks at you and says, Who are you? You know Sri Ramana Maharshi, that great Hindu sage of modern times? People used to come to him and say, Master, who was I in my last incarnation? As if that mattered. And he would say, Who is asking the question? And he'd look at you and say, basically go right down to it you're looking at me you're looking out and you're unaware of what's behind your eyes go back in and find out who you are where the question comes from why you ask and if you've looked at a photograph of that man I have a gorgeous photograph of it and you look in those I walk by it every time I go out of the front door and I look at those eyes and the humor in them, the lilting laugh that says Oh, come off it, man. <laughs> Shiva, I recognize you. When you come to my door and you say, I'm so-and-so, I say, ha ha, what a funny way God has come on today. <laughs> uh, there are all sorts of tricks, of course, that gurus play. They uh, say, well, we're going to put you through the mill. And the reason they do that is simply that you won't wake up until you feel you've paid a price for it. In other words, the sense of guilt that one has or the sense of anxiety is simply the way one experiences keeping the game of disguise going on. You see that? Supposing you say, I feel guilty. Christianity makes you feel guilty for existing. That somehow, the very fact that you exist is an affront. You are a fallen human being. I remember as a child when we went to the services of the church on Good Friday, they gave us each a colored postcard with Jesus crucified on it. And it said underneath, this have I done for thee, what doest thou for me? You know, you felt awful. You nailed that man to the cross. Because you eat steak, you have crucified Christ. Because you killed the bull, after all, you depend on it. Mithra, it's the same mystery. And what are you going to do about that? This have I done for thee, what doest thou for me? You feel awful that you just exist at all. 
But that sense, that sense of guilt is the veil across the sanctuary. Don't you dare come in. In order to, you know, in all mysteries, when you're going to be initiated, somebody saying, ah, 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 don't you come in. You've got to fulfill this requirement, and this requirement, and this requirement, and this requirement, then we'll let you in. So you go, you, you go through the mill. Why? Because this is, you are saying to yourself, I won't wake up until I feel I deserve it. I won't wake up until I've made it difficult for me to wake up. So I, I, I invent for myself an elaborate system of delaying my waking up. I put myself through this test and that test, and when I feel it's been sufficiently arduous, then I may at last admit to myself who I really am and draw aside the veil and realize that after all, when all is said and done, I am that I am, which is the name of God. And when it comes to it, that's really rather funny. They say in Zen, when you attain Satori, nothing is left to you at that moment but to have a good laugh. But naturally, uh, all masters, Zen masters, yoga masters, every kind of master, uh, puts up a barrier and says to you, he simply plays your own game. You know, we say anybody who goes to a psychiatrist ought to have his head examined. Because you, when you go to a psychiatrist, you define yourself as somebody who ought to have his head examined same way uh, the Zen masters say anybody who studies Zen or comes to a Zen master ought to be given 30 blows with a stick because he was stupid enough to pose the question that he had a problem but you're the problem you you put yourself in this situation so it's a question fundamentally do you define yourself as a victim of the world or as the world. You can define yourself. You see, if you identify you with what you call the voluntary system of the nerves and say, only that's me, and that's really a rather limited amount of my total performance, what I do voluntarily, then you've defined yourself as the victim in the game. And so you are able to feel that life was a trap something else whether it was god or whether it was fate or whether it was uh, the big mechanism the system imposed this on you and you can say poor little me but you can equally well and with just as much justification define yourself not only as what you do voluntarily but also what you do involuntarily that's you do do you beat your heart or don't you or does it just happen to you and if you define yourself as the works then nobody's imposing on you. You're not a victim. You're doing it. Because you can't explain how you do it in words because words are too clumsy. And it takes too long to say. You get bored with it. But actually, then you can say, with, with gusto, I am responsible for this life. Whether comedy or tragedy, I did it. And it seems to me that that is a basis for behavior and going on, which is more fundamentally joyous and profitable and uh, great than defining ourselves as miserable victims or sinners. Out of Your Mind now continues with the next lecture from the Nature of Consciousness Lecture Series. I was 
discussing an alternative myth to the ceramic and fully automatic models of the universe. I'll call the dramatic myth. The idea that life as we experience it is a big act and that behind this big act is the player. And uh, the player, or the self as it's called in Hindu philosophy, the Atman, is you. Only you are playing hide and seek, since that is the essential game that's going on. It's the game of games, it's the basis of all games, hide and seek. And so since you're playing hide and seek, you are deliberately, although you can't admit this, or won't admit it, you are deliberately forgetting who you really are, or what you really are. And the knowledge that your essential self is the foundation of the universe, the ground of being, as Tillich calls it is something you have as what the Germans call a Hintergedanke. A Hintergedanke is a thought way, way, way in the back of your mind, way back here somewhere. Something that you know deep down, but uh, can't admit. So, in a way then, in, in order to bring this to the front, in order to know that that is the case, you have to be kitted out of your game. You see, the problem is this. We identify in our experience a differentiation between what we do and what happens to us. We have a certain number of actions that we define as voluntary. And we feel in control of those. And then over against that, there is uh, all those things that are involuntary. But the dividing line between these two is very arbitrary. Because, for example, when you uh, move your hand, you feel that you decide whether to open it or to close it. But then ask yourself, how do you decide? When you decide to open your hand, do you first decide to decide? You don't, do you? You just decide, and how do you do that? And if you don't know how you do it, is it voluntary or involuntary? Let's consider breathing. You can feel that you breathe deliberately. You can control your breath. But when you don't think about it, it goes on. Is it voluntary or involuntary? So we come to have a very arbitrary definition of self. That much of my activity, which I feel I do, and that then doesn't include breathing most of the time. It doesn't include the heartbeats. It doesn't include uh, the activity of the glands. It doesn't include digestion. It doesn't include how you shape your bones, circulate your blood. Do you or do you not do these things? Now, if you get with yourself, <clears throat> and you find out that you are all of yourself, a very strange thing happens. You find that your body knows that you are one with the universe. In other words, that the so-called involuntary circulation of your blood is one continuous process with the stars shining. If you find out that it's you who circulates your blood, you will at the same moment find out that you are shining the sun. Because your physical organism is one continuous process with everything else that's going on. Just as the waves are continuous with the ocean, your body is continuous with the total energy system of the cosmos. And it's all you. Only you're playing the game that you're only this bit of it. But as I tried to explain, there are in physical reality no such things as separate events. So then, remember also when I tried to work towards a definition of omnipotence. Omnipotence is not 
knowing how everything is done. It's just doing it. You don't have to translate it into language. Look, supposing when you got up in the morning, you had to switch your brain on. And you had to think and do as a deliberate process, waking up all the circuits that you need for active life during the day. Why, you'd never get done. Because you have to do all those things at once. How can a centipede control a hundred legs at once? Because it doesn't think about it. And so in the same way, you are unconsciously performing all the various activities of your organism. Only unconsciously isn't a good word because it sounds sort of dead. Superconsciously would be better. Give it a plus rather than a minus. Because what a consciousness is, is simply a sort of specialized form of awareness. When you uh, look around the room, you are conscious of as much as you can notice. And you see an enormous number of things which you don't notice. If, for example, I look at a girl here and somebody asks me later, what was she wearing? I may not know, although I've seen, because I didn't attend. But I was aware, you see. And perhaps if I could, uh, under hypnosis, be asked this question, where I would get my conscious attention out of the way be, through being in the hypnotic state, I could recall what dress she was wearing. So then, just in the same way as you don't focus your attention on how you make your thyroid gland function, so in the same way you don't have any attention focused on how you shine the sun. So then, let me connect this with the problem of birth and death puzzles people enormously, of course. Because in order to understand what, what the self is, you have to remember that it doesn't need to remember anything. Just like you don't need to know how you work your thyroid gland. So then, when you die, you're not going to have to put up with everlasting non-existence, because that's not an experience. A lot of people are afraid that when they die, they're going to be locked up in a dark room forever and, it, and sort of undergo that. But one of the most interesting things in the world, this is a yoga, this is a way of realization. Try and imagine what it will be like to go to sleep and never wake up. Think about that. Children think about it one of the great wonders of life. What will it be like to go to sleep and never wake up? And if you think long enough about that, something will happen to you. You will find out, among other things, that uh, it will pose the next question to you. What was it like to wake up after having never gone to sleep? That was when you were born. You see, you, you can't have an experience of nothing. Nature abhors a vacuum. So after you're dead, the only thing that can happen is the same experience or the same sort of experience as when you were born. In other words, we all know very well that after people die, other people are born. And they're all you. Only you can only experience it one at a time. Everybody is I. You all know you are you. And wheresoever beings exist throughout all galaxies, it doesn't make any difference. You are all of them. And when they come into being, that's you coming into being. You know that very well. Only you don't have to remember the past in the same way you don't have to think about how you work your thyroid gland or whatever else it is in your organism. You don't have to know how to shine the sun. You just do it like you breathe. Isn't it, doesn't it really astonish you that you are this fantastically complex thing? And that you're doing all of this and you never had any education in how to do it? 
you've never learned to procure this miracle? Well, the point is that from a strictly physical, scientific standpoint, this organism is a continuous energy with everything else that's going on. And if I am my foot, I am the sun. Only we've got this little partial view, we've got the idea that no, I'm just something in this body. The ego. That's a joke. The ego is nothing other than the focus of conscious attention. It's like a radar on a ship. The radar on a ship is a troubleshooter. Is there anything in the way? And conscious attention is a designed function of the brain to scan the environment, like a radar does. And note for any troublemaking changes. But if you identify yourself with your troubleshooter, then naturally you define yourself as being in a perpetual state of anxiety. And the moment we cease to identify with the ego, and become aware that we are the whole organism, you realize the, as the first thing how harmonious it all is. Because your organism is a miracle of harmony. All this thing functioning together. Even those corpuscles and uh, creatures that are fighting each other in the bloodstream and eating each other up. If they weren't doing that, you wouldn't be healthy. So what is discord at one level of your being is harmony at a higher level. And you begin to realize that and you begin to be aware too that the discords of your life and the discords of people's life, which are a fight at one level, at a higher level of the universe, are healthy and harmonious. And you suddenly realize that everything that you are and do is at that level as magnificent and as free of any blemish as the patterns in waves. The markings in marble, the way a cat moves, and that this world is really okay and can't be anything else because otherwise it couldn't exist. But the reality underneath physical existence, or which really is physical existence, because in my philosophy there's no difference between the physical and the spiritual. These are absolutely out of date categories. It's all process. It isn't stuff on the one hand and form on the other. It's just, it is pattern, life is pattern. It is a dance of energy. So I will never invoke spooky knowledge. Now, that is to say that I've had a private revelation or that I have sensory vibrations going on a plane which you don't have. Everything is standing right out in the open. And it's just a question of how you look at it. So you do discover when you realize this the most extraordinary thing to me that I never cease to be flabbergasted about whenever it happens to me. Some people will use a symbolism of the relationship of God to the universe, wherein God is, say, brilliant light, only somehow veiled, hiding underneath all these forms that you see as you look around you. So far, so good. But the truth is funnier than that. It is that you are looking right at the brilliant light now. That the experience you are having, which you call ordinary everyday consciousness, pretending you're not it, that experience is exactly the same thing as it. There's no difference at all. And when you find that out, you laugh yourself silly. <laughs> That's the great discovery. In other words, when you really start to see things and you look at an old paper cup and you go into the nature of what it is to see, what vision is, or what smell is, or what touches, you realize that that vision of the paper cup is the brilliant light of the cosmos. Nothing could be brighter. 10,000 suns couldn't be bright. Only they are hidden in the sense that all the points of the infinite light are so tiny.
you see them in the cup. They don't blow your eyes out. But it is actually, see, the source of all light is in the eye. If there were no eyes in this world, the sun would not be light. You evoke light out of the universe. In the same way, you, by virtue of having a soft skin, evoke hardness out of wood. Wood is only hard in relation to a soft skin. It's your eardrum that evokes noise out of the air. You, by being this organism, call into being the whole universe of light and color and hardness and heaviness and everything, you see? Uh, but in, in the mythology that we've sold ourselves on during the end of the 19th century, when people discovered how big the universe was, and that we live on a little planet in a solar system on the edge of a galaxy, which is a minor galaxy, everybody thought, ah, oh, we're really unimportant after all. God isn't there and doesn't love us. Nature doesn't give a damn. And uh, we put ourselves down, see? But actually, it's this little funny microbe tiny thing crawling on this little planet that's way out somewhere who has the ingenuity by nature of this magnificent organic structure to evoke the whole universe out of what would otherwise be mere quanta there's jazz going on but you see this little little ingenious organism is not merely some stranger in this this little organism on this little planet is what the whole show is growing there and so realizing its own presence well now here's the problem if this is the state of affairs which is so and if the, the consciousness state you are in at this moment is the same thing as what we might call the divine state if you do anything to make it different, it shows you don't understand that it's so. So the moment you start practicing yoga, or praying, or meditating, or indulging in some sort of spiritual cultivation, you are getting in your own way. The Buddha said, we suffer because we desire. If you can give up desire, you won't suffer. But he didn't say that as the last word. He said that as the opening step of a dialogue. Because the, if, he, if you say that to someone, they're going to come back after a while and say, yes, but I'm now desiring not to desire. And so the Buddha will answer, well, at last you're beginning to understand the point. Because you can't give up desire, why would you try to do that? It's already desire. So in the same way, you say, oh, you ought to be unselfish, or to give up your ego. Let go, relax. Why do you want to do that? Just because it's another way of beating the game, isn't it? But the moment you see you hypothesize that you are different from the universe, you want to get one up on it. But if you try to get one up on the universe and you're in competition with it, it means you don't understand you are it. You think there's a real difference between self and other. But self, what you call yourself and what you call other, are mutually necessary to each other, like back and front. They're really one. But just as a magnet polarizes itself in north and south, but it's all one magnet, so experience polarizes itself as self and other, but it's all one. So if you try to make the North Pole get the mastery of it, or the South Pole get the mastery of the North Pole, you show you don't know what's going on. A guru or teacher who wants to get this across to somebody, because he knows it himself, and when you know it, you know, you like others to see it too. So what he does is he gets you into being ridiculous, harder and more assiduously than usual. In other words, if you are in a contest with the universe, he's going to stir up that contest until it becomes ridiculous. And so he sets you such tasks as saying, now of course, in order to be a true person, you must give up yourself. 
be uncertain. So the Lord sits, steps down out of heaven and says, the first and great commandment is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. You must love me. Well, that's a double bind. You can't love on purpose. You can't be sincere purposely. It's like trying not to think of a green elephant while taking medicine. <laughs> but if a person really tries to do it, so, you know, this is the way Christianity is rigged, you should be very sorry for your sins. And though everybody knows they're not, but they think they ought to be, and so they go around trying to be penitent, or trying to be humble. And they know the more assiduously they practice it, the phonier and phonier the whole thing gets. And so in this way, it's, a, what, it's called a, the technique of reductio ad absurdum. If you think you have a problem, you see, and that you're an ego, and that you're in difficulty, the answer that the Zen master makes to you is, show me your ego. I want to see this thing that has a problem. When Bodhidharma, the legendary founder of Zen, came to China, a disciple came to him and said, I have no peace of mind. Please pacify my mind. And Bodhidharma said, bring out your mind here before me and I'll pacify it. Well, he said, when I look for it, I can't find it. So Bodhidharma said, there, it's pacified. See, because when you look for your own mind, that is to say your own particularized center of being, which is separate from everything else, you won't be able to find it. But the only way you'll know it isn't there is if you look for it hard enough to find out that it isn't there. And so everybody says, all right, know yourself, look within, find out who you are. Because the harder you look, you won't be able to find it. And then you'll realize that it isn't there at all. There isn't a separate you. Your mind is what there is, everything. But the only way to find that out is to persist in the state of delusion as hard as possible. That's one way. I didn't say the only way, but it is one way. And so almost all spiritual disciplines, meditations, prayers, etc., etc., are ways of persisting in folly, doing resolutely and consistently what you're doing already. So if a person believes that the earth is flat, you can't talk him out of that. He knows it's flat. You go out of the window and see it. Obviously it looks flat. So the only way to convince him that it isn't is to say, well, let's go and find the edge. And in order to find the edge, you've got to be very careful not to walk in circles. You'll never find it that way. So we've got to go consistently in a straight line, due west, along the same line of latitude. And eventually when we get back to where we started from, you've convinced the guy that the earth is round. But that's the, that's the only way that'll, tell, that'll teach him. Because people can't be talked out of illusions. Well now there is another possibility, however. But this is more difficult to describe. Let's say uh, we, we take as the basic supposition, which is the thing that one sees in the experience of satori or awakening or whatever you want to call it, that this now moment in which I'm talking and you're listening is eternity. That although we have somehow conned ourselves into the notion that this moment is rather ordinary, and that we may not feel very well, and that uh, we're sort of vaguely frustrated and worried and so on, and that it ought to be changed. This is it. So you don't need to do anything at all. But the difficulty about explaining that is that don't, you, you mustn't try not to do anything, because that's doing something. And how to explain that? Because there's nothing to explain. It's the, it, it, it is the way it is now. And if you understand that, it will automatically wake you up. That's why Zen teachers use shock treatment to uh, sometimes why they hit people or shout at them or cr create a sudden surprise. 
because it is that jolt that suddenly brings you here. See, there's no road to here because you're already there. And if you ask me, how am I going to get here? It'll be like the famous story of the American tourist in England who asked some yokel the way to Upper Tuddenham, a little village. And the yokel scratched his head and he said, Well, sir, I do know where it is, but if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> so, you see, when you ask, how do I attain the knowledge of God? How do I attain nirvana, liberation? <laughs>